It's difficult to come after Beth, you know. <laughs> so, um, well, first of all, of all, I'd like to thank to Peter, to Noella, uh, and also, of course, to, to Gerlinde, who could deal with my lack of sense of organization and actually got me here. Um, I put the, the bank logo here um, just to show my affiliation, but I, I cannot talk on behalf of the bank, and frankly, I prefer not to. So uh, this is just to, uh, to show, um, I, I was planning to, so if I'm talking to you as something, I'm talking a bit of kind of like as a retired fellow researcher who tried to, like on my daily work, try to use a bit of research on what I do. So basically my work nowadays is really to implement e-democracy projects, but in practice, all those ideas that I thought were great, now I realize 90% of them don't work. Um, <laughs> So, um, so somebody that is doing work and looking at research and seeing how that could inform uh, my work. I was going to talk about technology and citizen participation and so on, but then I tried some, to do something different and probably much more boring, which is looking at, at the field of e-participation research and um, where it stands and how it informs our work. You know? But just uh, here's an overview of, of what I'm going to talk. First, I'll talk of what I call like a semantic extravaganza in our field in terms of new meanings. Second, where participation stands, then where to go, and then like a small story about the Napoleonic semaphore, just to let us put us a bit into perspective. So um, on to uh, semantic extravaganza. So many of you guys probably know Tom Steinberg, who's director of my society, and recently he wrote a blog post in which he said, what primary movement or sector is my society part of? Or Avaz, or Kiva, or Wikileaks? When I ask myself these questions, no obvious words or names raise quickly or clearly to mind. There is a gap, or at best quite a bit of fuzziness, where the labels should go. This lack of good labels should surprise us, because the groups definitely, because these groups definitely have aims and goals, normally explicit, also, it is unusual because social and political movements tend to be quite good at developing names and sticking to them. I mean, myself, I think I've been working on this uh, for, for, for 12 years. Um, and I've seen like lots of names coming. No? So e-democracy, tele-democracy, e-participation, e-governance, Gov 2.0, open government, collaborative governance, and we could go on and on and on and on. No? So um, why... What are the reasons uh, for, for so many names in a field that should be terminologically stable? If we're researchers, first thing that we do is to have like a stable terminology. You know, that's why we have scientific names for plants. Uh, so um, first, why uh, this, uh, this happens? No, one thing, there's a logical fallacy which is called argumentum ad novitatem, no, which is the appeal to novelty. No, so the appeal to novelty is something that says that basically if something is new, it's better. I think it's particularly appealing for a group uh, like us that work with technology where 2.0 is better than 1.0. No? So we already have this sense of, of like maybe if it's new, it's more appealing and maybe come up with more names. No? There's also a bit of like a technological millennialism. Why talk about teledemocracy? That's old. I mean, if there's one thing about humankind is that we like to feel that we live kind of like a unique moment in history. You find like very little reports of people say, oh, now it's really boring and nothing is happening. No? So maybe kind of like creating new words also give us that sense of belonging to something special. No? But there's also the notion of semantic plasticity, which is what some, some science historians have been looking at is that New fields, they come like with terms that can adapt to what people are saying. So they might adapt conveniently to what they're saying. So take, for instance, the term open data government and its ambiguity. No? Sometimes it is about accountability, but sometimes it's just about improving services. And we don't know where it stands, and we can actually, you know, 
If you're talking to a country that is not very democratic, then you're going to talk about quality of services, you know? Then if you're talking to somebody more normative or to this public here, we're going to talk about access to information, democracy, and so on, you know? Also, of course, it creates new audiences. So um, it opens new markets to create new names, you see? I don't know if you guys saw that, like, this work on... Um, on experts, no, apparently it takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become expert at something, you know? But it takes only a few tweets to become a Golf 2.0 guru, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, so it is really good. So there's lots of, of, uh, of good points for that, or at least incentives for doing so. But Tom hits the nail on the head when he says about this provision of names that he says, and this worries me because consistent names help causes to persist over time. If the fields of AIDS research had been renamed every six months, could it have lasted as it did? Flightly, narrowly used language confuses supporters, prevent focus, and is generally the enemy of long-term success. No, I couldn't agree more, and uh, I think there are like some problems. So, now, in the development world, which I'm now part of to some extent, they come up with the new term feedback loops. So now, if you're like going to open government conferences and you have lots of people uh, about transparency, technology, accountability, and development nerds, they're going to talk about feedback loops, you know? I mean, nobody explains what it really is, but it normally alludes to an idea of like citizen engagement with government responding to them. That is the great feedback loop. Breakthrough. You know? So, I mean, it's not a problem uh, with coming up with new names, but so recently this guy, Nathaniel Heller, he's a prominent voice in the open government partnership. Uh, and particularly, let's say, what I would say, the Washingtonian circles. No? And he asked, like, is there a case against feedback loops? Okay? So he basically asked, well, is feedback loop good or not? But he was talking about citizen engagement, you know? Until today, his post nobody has answered because his feedback looper friends cannot link it back to the evidence of citizen engagement. Because maybe, yes, there's a case sometimes against participatory democracy under some circumstances, and in others not. But what I'm saying here is that basically the field, you know, when you do this, when you create new words, you are unable to connect with existing knowledge. So you create new words, there's no connection with existing knowledge, and then people start to ask for evidence all over again. So now in the de development world, looking at technology and accountability and these things, now the answer for everything is randomized controlled trials. Let's start doing them all over because they're unable to look back what was happening. No? So these constant calls for evidence and, and so on, they are contrasted by a total lack of, let's say, terminological consistency. So this was the first point that I wanted to do, is that we should start to thinking about how to be more consistent about terms that we use in our field. No? So how long is e-democracy going to last? And what comes next? And should we move away from e-democracy? Now, let me go where the field stands. And here I'm talking about participation and technology and participation. So apparently we did some progress in some areas of our field. If you look, for instance, e-voting, you know, what was the effect on internet on voting 10 years ago and now, we know a lot more, particularly because of experiences in Switzerland, Estonia, that have been systematically evaluated. We, we now have more or less an idea of where things stand. This is just an example, and there are other fields on e-participation where we went. So we have some progress. No, but if you look at the last, for instance, two literature reviews that were made, more serious literature reviews that were made about the field of e-participation, this is what comes out. 
It's biased, it's under-theorized, techno-deterministic, fragmented, and methodologically immature. No? So this is a bit what a review of the literature on e-participation would look like. No? So I don't want to go on the reasons for that, but I would go a bit on how should we go, or more or less kind of like the, the way forward. You know, this kind of stuff, the way forward, I'm already getting from development work. When they do a report, they do a title, and then they put the way forward on the bottom. Um, <clears throat> so I think one of the first things that I should do in the field of e-participation is connect with the participation field, offline participation. I mean, we have thousands of years of knowledge about participation. If we look, I mean, there is this guy, Pedro Prieto Martin, recently he made like a review of uh, EU-funded projects, and he said, I mean, most of the projects funded with research and everything, they came to conclusions that basically we knew already. You know, should we have like bothered reading about participatory democracy, institutional design of participation, and so on, we wouldn't have needed to waste so much money on things that we knew already. No, so connecting with the participation field, but I'm saying beyond the Habermasian, you know? I mean, thank you for all that content analysis to see if we meet the deliberative idea or not, you know? But I mean, we need to move forward a little bit. I mean, no criticism about it, but I'm just saying that we have linked very well to the deliberative democracy to some extent, the field of participation, but it didn't look at other things. What other things I'm talking about? So for instance, we haven't looked a lot at matters of institutional design. You know, but really who participates when they participate? What is the link to decision making? You know, methods of citizen selection. You know, this is a debate that is going on now in the participation field. Many publics, experts, as, as Beth was saying, self-selection, the implications of that, sequencing. It's a whole, let's say, kind of like the edge of participatory democracy now. How to sequence aggregative models of participation with deliberative models of participation. How to overcome the apparently or maybe truly false dilemma of good deliberation with mass participation. How do we combine these things? This would probably uh, be uh, pushing us forward. Another thing, crowdsourcing. You know, crowdsourcing is a very interesting field, which sometimes, I would say, is also poorly defined. We don't know what it means. No? But if you look at the literature on crowdsourcing, with few exceptions, and Beth is one of them, no? you'd start to wonder how much progress have we made since Condorcet's jury theorem about 200 years ago. You know, and actually, we know lots of people who are doing stuff about crowdsourcing and are not even familiar with that, with the beginning of the things. No? And if we want to do well this idea of leveraging the expertise of citizens, we're going to have to go even beyond the participatory democracy literature. So just to give an idea of how we can get to these different disciplinary perspectives, here are some kind of like literature that could inform us. First, Democracy and Knowledge by Josiah Ober, looking like classical Athens, and how they organized knowledge institutionally to leverage the knowledge of the Athenians, which made them kind of like overpower everybody else. It was a matter of institutional design, no? I mean, how many of you have read a paper that mentioned crowdsourcing in the last year? Raise your hands. Yeah. How many of you have read a paper that mentioned epistemic democracy in the last year? Okay, well, you're nerds. <laughs> okay, so because if you want to connect, for instance, on leveraging that, we should also be looking at this matter of epistemic democracy. It's boring, sometimes there's lots of math and so on. And we should also look at people who are doing different studies and doing mathematical modeling to see under which circumstances crowds can produce actually better knowledge. So just to say, we have to move a bit more. So to finish a bit, I'd like to give you a historical perspective. 
Does anybody know what it is? Good. It's the French semaphore. So, right after the the French Revolution in 1795, there was this French engineer uh, called um, Claude Chap, which invented the French semaphore, which was also called the Napoleonic Telegraph. You know? So basically, there would be a guy sitting here with a big kind of like telescope looking, and these would make signs, all right? These would make signs which would send to another tower, relayed to another tower, and then was the first time the message could travel faster than horses. It was like they could send messages across the whole of France, and it was like a whole new, wasn't a revolution, no? In, in information technologies. So there was lots of excitement about it at the time at the potential of democracy. So here's a man of science, was a member of the Academy of Science in France, who says that. Someone made a remark about the telegraph, which seems to me infinitely correct, and which brings out its full importance. Namely that, at bottom, this invention might suffice to make possible the establish of democracy among a large population. Many respectable men, poor Rousseau, including Jean-Jacques Rousseau, thought that the establishment of democracy was impossible among large populations. How could such a people deliberate? Among the ancients, all the citizens were assembled in a single place. They communicated their will. The invention of the telegraph is a new factor that Rousseau did not include in his calculations. It can be used to speak at great distances, as fluently and as distinctly as in a room. There is no reason why it would not be possible for all the citizens of France to communicate their will within a rather short time in such a way that this communication might be considered instantaneous. Was the first democracy statement probably written in history, no? And what is interesting, the code of, of the telegraph, it was encrypted because of war. And you had a movement that wanted to open that code. So it was actually also the first open source movement as well. <laughs> and they would say, we open that code and everything is going to be great. Democracy is going to be renewed. Of course, we know it didn't happen. No? So what I want to say is that maybe we should um, kind of like step back a bit and look at history and see that we, we never managed our expectations. And by not managing them, and by being technocentric, we failed. This is not a cyber optimistic or cyber pessimistic uh, stance that I say here. Actually, I think that's another thing that we should move on. <laughs> Frankly, Clay Shirk and Morozov, I can take it. You know, I mean, I thought we had settled that ten years ago in the literature. But anyway, we should just kind of like maybe take a more realistic stance and see where we should go, or take a bit more of like the Gramscian attitude and go with the pessimism of the intellect, but the optimism of the will. Thank you very much.